Uh, so first thing I'm going to do is hit record, as always, and um, let's jump straight in, guys. Uh, I'm, I'm excited about today's topic on how to evolve uh, as a virtual leader and coach. Uh, I think most of us are pretty <laughs> familiar with Zoom now. Some of us may be less familiar with Microsoft Teams uh, and all of the other digital platforms, but what's next, right? And that's kind of what got me thinking about the content for today's session is like, okay, we've got the basics. How can we build on those basics to take our leadership and coaching to the next level in this virtual environment? Because guess what? It's here to stay, right? It's, it's not going away. I've got corporate clients who have booked virtual sessions up until the middle of October right now uh, because we simply don't know if we're going to be able to travel again. And most of my sessions are with normally with the senior executive teams where they normally would fly them into Bangkok or Singapore or Malaysia or wherever. We simply don't know. So this style of doing webinars and workshop and coaching, it's, it's here to stay in this virtual format. So what can we do to take it to the next level? And um, listen, guys, this is very interactive. Again, if it's your first time here, I do encourage you to share. We're going to be using the chat box a lot. So if you have questions, uh, put it into the chat box. If I ask a question you want to contribute and answer, pop it into the chat box so we can learn together. That would be amazing. So let us go ahead. I'm going to share my screen, guys, and let us jump in. Fantastic. So uh, just a quick um, mention, you know, the, these tools and techniques that I'm sharing are from the coaching world. So basically on how to coach individuals and leaders and teams to the next level of success and also the world of NLP, uh, also known as Neuro Linguistic Programming. This is basically a set of tools and processes on how to reorganize the way that we think to improve performance, communication and so on. And these are just some of the companies that I work with around the region, uh, utilizing these tools and techniques to help their teams grow to the next level. So in these short one hour webinars, I'm taking bits and pieces out of all of my library uh, of content to, to share with you in one hour. So please rest assured, everything here is really international, world-class. Here are some of the webinars that we've delivered over the last few months. Please do subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, the link is in the comment box there. And if you don't have a full hour to watch the webinar, please do join us in our Facebook group. Uh, this is really for leaders, where we share leadership tips in less than 60 seconds. So it's a nice way to get a few little tips throughout your leadership journey. Uh, and of course, I have my amazing wife slash business partner, Coach Christy, uh, who just received her MCC credential from the ICF. The MCC credential is the world's uh, most uh, recognized coaching credential for professional coaches. So today's agenda is going to be about developing flexibility and agility. One of the most essential skills you just need as a good leader, but especially as a virtual leader and as a virtual coach, we, we must have a belief in possibilities and solutions. You know, I know when I first started doing these webinars, I had a belief that, you know, I'm, I'm too old, I can't work this technology, I'm not a techie kind of guy. And, and these were some of these limiting beliefs that I had back in the early days uh, at the end of March. Well, thankfully I got over that and, and developed a possible, you know, belief in possibilities and solutions that actually technology uh, can be used and can be utilized very, very well. Uh, we're going to look at how can we adjust to the client's needs, including who are our clients, right? Because guess what? You're going to have your client clients and your co-worker is a client. Your subordinates are a client. Your boss is a client. So how can we adjust to our client's needs in this virtual world? Tapping into your enthusiasm, passion, and your presence. Being present means being here right now, not being distracted. Virtual presentation, best practices. Now look, I'm here to tell you I'm not a IT guru by any stretch of the imagination. I just got excited because I just bought a new laptop. This is the first Zoom session that I'm running from my new laptop today. 
So I know there are a hundred different ways I could improve my presentations, but I just want to cover some of the basics. Some of you are much, much more technically adept than I am. And of course, with our, uh, some of our bigger uh, events that we do virtually, we, we have the, the poll function and I have virtual flip charts and whiteboard and all of those other things. I'd really like some of your suggestions here on what some of your virtual presentation best practices are when we get to that point. Implementation of a can I mindset. So can I mindset is from Tony Robbins, which simply means constant and never ending improvement constant and never ending improvement. That's a really positive mindset to have, uh, regardless of how experienced you are as a leader, regardless of how good you are as a coach, regardless of how technically savvy you are in the virtual world, there's always, always, always areas to grow and improve. And much more, and of course, your questions as well. So I did cover this in a couple of webinars, maybe, well, I don't know, five or six webinars ago. And I wanted to recap it very, very quickly for those who are joining us for the first time. Um, this is about how to engage in your teams virtually at kind of like the fundamental level. Hopefully most of you have already been able to uh, employ some of the tips and techniques. And the first main thing you wanna do when engaging your teams virtually, and, and by the way, if you suddenly get promoted to a new position, you're going to have a new team. Or maybe you've joined another company, you've started a new position in a new company, or maybe you're starting up your own business. Whatever the case might be, with that team, that new team or the existing team, you want to agree communication strategies. And what do we mean by communication strategies or by agreeing them? is there are many different ways to communicate, obviously face to face, but especially in the virtual world. And you can tell your people what to do. You can write up a very detailed SOP, a standard operating procedure and say, hello team, this is how we're going to communicate. This is the gospel, follow this, do this, or there'll be a problem. Yeah, I'm not sure that that strategy works so well, especially if you're a little bit more <coughs> mature, such as myself, chances are your younger team are going to know a lot, lot more about uh, ways to use these digital communication strategies. So what does that mean is you get them together as a team and you have a discussion as mature adults and you simply uh, brainstorm options to communicate clearly in your team. And then you agree on those strategies and then you can formulate an SOP so it's very, very clear and very, very transparent. So what do we mean by communication strategies? What are the frequencies of some of the meetings that you're going to have? Do you have like a monthly meeting? Is there a weekly meeting? Is there a daily meeting? Uh, what's the frequency? How often? Then what platforms are you going to use? My preference, I like to use Zoom, and I've been working with companies who prefer Microsoft Teams, and there are a new platforms coming up every day. So again, you simply need to agree. I'm, I'm not gonna tell you what is right and what is wrong. What I'm just going to recommend is that with your team, as you have that discussion, you simply agree uh, on what platforms are best. Uh, what are the duration of these communications, these meetings? I know some companies, they simply set a 30 minute time limit on any meeting, whether it's virtual or face to face. And that's the rule that they have. And, you know, in addition to that, they will email out an agenda beforehand so everyone can know what to expect and prepare accordingly. This is a really good way to significantly shorten meeting times is by setting a time limit on it, a maximum period of time. How do you address urgent communications versus non-urgent communication? So there'll be some things in the business, something will suddenly pop up that needs to be addressed very, very urgently. And then there'll be other things that are say less urgent and so for example here at coachology uh, we have a, a group a line group uh, the line platform uh, on our telephones here which you can also use on your laptop now it's very very convenient 
and uh, we have all of our team in the organization in the line group and we use the line group for general communication something that needs to generally happen within the day right so for example my team will send me just two or three bullet points of what they're going to do today what they are focusing on today and then i also do the same i will send them uh, a list of two or three things that i am going to focus on today just so we simply know what everyone is doing because here at coachology we've been working remotely for three years so when it came to lockdown things didn't change that much for us because we were already well established at working remotely now you know what we do if we have something urgent very technical we pick up the phone and we make a phone call. That's, that's our strategy that we've agreed as a team if something is urgent, right? Because texts might get missed or whatever. So we know, I know if one of my team is calling and I see their number, I know that it's urgent. So I'm gonna make, it call, make that call. Why? Because we've agreed that strategy in advance. Uh, emails we also use and that will be for more larger more complicated projects and, and uh, uh, where we need a trail of things that are going on like on a project implementation or something like that clear and then you might also have an action plan or a gantt chart so again there's no real right or wrong here it's just what you agree and decide together as a team Right now, the other thing you want to be able to think about differently, and, and this is perhaps a little bit more challenging for organizations, is agree on how to measure effectiveness. Now, again, this is very, very uh, important for teams that are working remotely. In other words, they're not coming into the office, they're still working from home, uh, or they're out and about on the road. Um, they don't often have the opportunity to clock in and clock out, right? So you can't measure effectiveness now by a stamp clock or a fingerprint scan. That doesn't work anymore. So if you're the leader or the boss or the manager, we need to begin to get a little bit more creative on how we measure the effectiveness of our teams. Because I know a lot of organisations now, even though uh, in uh, Bangkok here, for example, lockdown has been fully lifted. People can move around freely. I can tell by the volume of traffic on the road here in Bangkok. And by the way, if you've not been to Bangkok before, the traffic is really, really bad. Um, but I can tell by the volume of traffic that there are less people moving around the city. So what does that mean? It means there are still people, a lot of people who are working from home. So because you can't clock in and clock out like that, you need to look at other metrics, other ways to measure the effectiveness, such as KPIs, key performance indicators, such as due dates on specific tasks or projects. There might be project milestones that needed to be complete. Project completion, if you're working on a small, medium or big project that it has a project completion date by here, and then there are these milestones between now and between then. Um, how are things handled when they're urgent versus important and being able to prioritize those kinds of things? Because yes, your team might be working on two or three things in a day, but then something urgent pops up. Well, how are you going to kind of rejuggle and reorganize that? So again, my recommendation here is you have a conversation with your team and agree on those strategies on how to do that. Now, I would love it if someone has some specific other techniques on how you can measure effectiveness, please, please, please drop those into the, um, into the chat box now because I would love to be able to hear them. Uh, let's see here, we have a question. As leaders, do we even need to measure effort? Can we just measure deliverables instead of and allow employees to work at whatever times that suits them? <laughs> exactly. Uh, my answer to that, uh, Elizabeth, is absolutely yes. T to be honest, I don't care when my team does the work, I don't care how they do it, I don't care if they do it on a Saturday evening or a Sunday morning and then they have Monday as a day off. As long as I have my list of things that I need done by a certain time frame, 
I don't mind how they do it. Can they do it from home? Can they do it from the Starbucks? Can they do it while they're on holiday? For me personally, I'm, I'm not really, I'm not looking at their effort. I'm just looking at the end result. And so what that does in my experience, it gives my team a lot more freedom, a lot more autonomy to, measure, uh, to manage themselves. Now, having said that, do I select the team that work with me carefully? Do I make sure that they are very, very proactive and self-motivating? Absolutely, that's an absolute requirement in my business and from my point of view, right? Now, there, there, is, there is my team's happiness important to me? A absolutely, and again, I set very, very clear expectations from the beginning. So what do I mean by that is when Coachology started up officially about three years ago, I, I've been a coach and a trainer for more than 10 years and Coachology was born about three years ago now. Um, in addition to my wife and uh, myself, uh, Coach Christy, uh, employee number one, her name is Gick and she is amazing. And when we were going through the interviewing process, I was just very, very clear and said, listen, Geek, uh, we're, we're, we're a startup, basically. Um, and in the beginning, uh, I need you to do little bits of everything. Uh, you'll need to support us with accounting. You'll need to support us with admin. You'll need to support us with event coordination. Uh, you'll need to support us with customer service. Uh, and there'll be some uh, PA duties, personal assistant duties as well because you know, we're starting up. And I said, uh, are you okay with that? And she said, yes, I am. Now I explored that a little bit more to make sure she fully understood on what that meant. And, and it's been working amazing, right? And as she has grown within the organization, she now has more of a focus area. So instead of being a Jill of all trades doing everything, which she can do now, now uh, she has other people that can help her to do those more menial or mundane tasks, right? So such as an assistant or outsourcing or contracting or whatever. So setting expectations is absolutely key, Michael. Absolutely it is, yeah? So again, this is from my point of view. This is what I see that's working very, very well. And for the organisations that I've worked with as well, that we can't just assume that because they're here at nine o'clock and they finish at five o'clock, that they're going to be very productive or efficient in their work. So we need to shift that kind of focus on hours at the office or virtual office and instead focus on the outputs, right? Focus on what it is that needs to be complete within the day, within the week, within the month. Now, is that going to take a little bit of time to set up? Absolutely, guys. But if you haven't done it yet, I invite you to do it with your teams sooner rather than later. Why? Because virtual leadership is not going away. It's here to stay. So your ability to be able to manage teams remotely is going to have you established as a very competent leader. Does that make sense, guys? Yes? Awesome. Fantastic. So yeah, based on these expectations, here's a great little exercise that you can do with your teams. Uh, it can be if you're the leader in the team and you're wanting to do this uh, inside of your team. It also works very, very well with other teams in another department, for example. And it's simply a, a really simple exercise. It's one of my favorite exercises to do when I get called in to do a, a leadership training or a strategic alignment or a conflict resolution workshop. This tool, it's so simple and it's so powerful, but you can do it yourself. You can facilitate it yourself very, very easily. So it's simply about getting clear about what are your expectations for each other. And you simply get in a group of two and you say to the other person, so let's, for example, let's say that I'm the uh, finance director, just for example, and I'm talking to uh, Michael, who I know very well. And I say, uh, Michael, in my role as finance director, please tell me, your expectations of me so we can create greater synergy. So I ask that question and then I be quiet and I be respectful 
and I write down anything my friend says, and then I say thank you, right? So what do we mean by that is I will ask, what's your expectations of me? Oftentimes, people will give you a list of two or three or four things, right? And so you simply get clear on those things, and it's not the time to interrupt. It's not the time to say, that's unrealistic, that's not fair. We don't do that right now. All you do is respectfully listen. Then you say thank you. Then it's the other person's time. So let's say Michael is the operations director, for example. Then Michael would say to me, Mr. Luke, in my role as operations director, what is your expectation of me? And then respectfully, I will share. Respectfully, he will listen. He will write them down and he will say, Thank you. Now, the beauty of this exercise is it's focusing on the future. We're not dragging up stuff from the past, right? That's a separate tool or technique that you would uh, do that with. Think of direct communication or giving feedback or, or something else. That's something slightly different if you're focusing on the past. This is we're not dragging up the stuff from, from the past. We're simply creating a clear path forward about clear expectations. Now, once both people have shared their expectations, is that now a possibility to open up a further discussion about what is realistic or, well, that doesn't quite fall under my job description or I would love to be able to help that and I don't think I have the resources. Yeah, you can have that discussion afterwards, after you've each elicited those clear points on the way forward. The rest of it is simply two adults having a, a mature conversation. Sometimes it might be like a negotiation. That's okay. That's all part of the process. And, and remember, your clear communication will solve, I don't know, 98% of all of your problems. And so this little expectations exercise is a really, really nice way to be able to create clarity in your communication. Okay, no copy of the slides today. And uh, we'll be, uh, you'll, this will be uploaded to YouTube. So you can review it again on YouTube. If you wanted to copy the slides yourself, then you can go ahead and copy the slides yourself off YouTube. You gotta put in a little bit of effort, guys. Okay, clear. So agility. Oh, this is what's going to help you to stand out either as a leader, if you're in a big organization, or whether you're self-employed or whether you have your own business or wherever, wherever you are in the world and whatever you're doing, to be agile is what's going to set you apart from everybody else. Now, let's have a look at some definitions here. Agile simply means to move quickly and easily, right? That's the definition of agile, to move quickly and easily, like the flash. So how do we apply that in leadership? Well, quite simply, we, agile leadership is the ability of a leader, the ability of a leader to be able to lead well in a wide range of circumstances, especially new, changing and ambiguous situations. Think VUCA. I'm sure you've all heard of VUCA before, volatile, uncertain, complex and ambiguous, if that makes sense. So that was a buzzword from maybe about two years ago. Uh, strangely, since COVID, no one talks about VUCA anymore, even though it's exactly what VUCA is all about. COVID is VUCA in, in, in reality. Now, I like to keep things as simple as I can. So my definition of agile leadership is to simply to lead well and quickly with flexibility. This is what my definition of agile leadership is. And I've worked with companies such as uh, Toyota and uh, Thai Country Club and a few others where we've helped them implement some of these agile leadership principles with all of their team. So again, agile leadership at its most simple is to lead well and quickly with flexibility. And this really is, is not only a mindset, it, it clearly it starts with a mindset to have an agile mindset, 
and to be agile in your behavior and your actions, right? Your behavior is simply what you do, therefore your actions. So in other words, because it's very clear that we're, li we're living in a changing world right now. There is so much uncertainty still out there, even post lockdown, well, in Thailand, some other countries are still going through the lockdown. Some are going through it for a second time. We don't know what's happening from one day to the next, especially with the way that our governments are choosing to respond to this situation. It's totally outside of our control. So what is within our control is the way that we respond to what's going on out there. And the greater the agility that we have, well, the more likely we are to adapt and succeed to this uncertain landscape and environment in which we live, right? So again, this virtual leadership and coaching, this uncertainty and unknown out there, it's, it's kind of here to stay. So your ability to create agility as a habit, as a way of thinking and a way of being and doing, will definitely support you very, very well in the future. So let's take a look at a quick uh, couple of characteristics of agile leaders. Firstly, they are curious, right? They're curious like a little kid. They're open-minded and they're hungry to learn uh, the truth, not about what mainstream media says, not about what the government is trying to let us uh, believe, but more curious about you know, what's going on at a bigger level what is curious about options, what are possibilities, what are some solutions? And they're also courageous, right? So to be courageous means getting outside of the comfort zone. It means trying new things. It means looking for a role model, someone who's already made those changes and following their strategy for success. Being courageous means doing something different, doing something that you've not done before. Right. Keep, if you keep doing the same thing, well, then that you're not curious and then you're not courageous. You're tucked in your little comfort zone, hoping, please, everything go back to normal. Please, everything go back to normal. Those prayers will not be answered. We actually have to do something about it ourselves. Yeah. Other characteristics, guys, of agile leaders, they are flexible. Right now, not necessary physically flexible. I'm still struggling to touch my toes. What I mean by flexible is flexible in thinking, flexible in seeing possibilities and options, and flexible in behavior. In other words, if something doesn't work, you try something different. And if that doesn't work, you try something different. That's the kind of flexibility that I'm talking about. Flexibility in ideas, flexibility in thinking, and flexibility in action, right? So one of the principles of NLP, and NLP stands for Neuro Linguistic Programming, if that's your first time hearing these three magical words. Uh, neuro, meaning the brain and how it's connected to everything. Linguistic, meaning language, language that we use, internal language, almost like a computer code we have that is programming Ourself. So our brain is like a computer. So one of the firm principles of NLP is called the law of requisite variety, which in English means the person with the most flexibility of behavior will control the system right? And call the system what it is. Is it, is it the project that you're working on? Is it the business that you're within? Is it your life? Like whatever it is, the system, what it, wherever you need to develop behavioral flexibility, the greater the behavioral flexibility you have, the greater that you'll be able to control and manage the system. Therefore, controlling the results. Yeah, it gives you a lot more uh, possibility. So I would like you to share with me, guys, please pop into the chat box. What flexibility have you adopted recently with great success? In other words, what did you do differently, whether it was because of COVID or lockdown or you lost your job or you moved somewhere, whatever it was for you, something that you didn't normally do, but something because out of necessity or you wanted to, 
you develop more flexibility and you got a good result. Please go ahead and put that, pop that into the chat box. Let me share a couple of uh, mine with you, which was, I got the nudge from lockdown. So uh, here at Coachology, our business model of delivering live trainings in a hotel environment, that model stopped on the 22nd of March when they started lockdown here in Thailand, where I'm based in Bangkok. So but uh, before the end of March, within one week, uh, using my uh, agility principles that, that I apply in my personal and professional life, we did our very first Wednesday webinar like we're doing here, right here, right now. And because of that online uh, webinar that we did, I had three of my existing clients call me straight after that webinar and said, hey, Luke, can you do that for us? And we got some great results. So through the lockdown period, up until what are we now, in July, uh, Coachology has had two of the best months ever in the three years of operation because we were flexible to adapt to deliver training and coaching online. Also delivering content online, what was one of the great successes is well now at our recent ICF coaching program, we had students from America, uh, South Africa, Kuwait, uh, Singapore and Malaysia. You, got, you guys are always coming to Bangkok, but you couldn't come to Bangkok. So we had uh, Singapore and Malaysia, we had Brunei and a few other countries as well. So instead of just focusing on Southeast Asia, maybe the 10 countries in Southeast Asia, because we were flexible and because we went online, now we have a truly worldwide audience who loved their training experience. And then finally, delivering content online. Well, because it allows us to connect with more people, then I'm fulfilling one of my purposes for why we started Coachology in the first place, which was to provide a positive impact for people around the world. And by doing these webinars, we've had more than 2,000 people join our webinar since we've done lockdown. 2,000 people that would have never have heard of us before. So thank you again for, for joining us and for allowing us to fulfill our passion and our purpose of creating a positive impact. Microsoft Teams. I don't know if you guys have used it or not. It's horrible. I don't like it. It's complicated. But guess what? My clients love it. They want it. It's more uh, technically secure if you ask the IT people. So because of our flexibility, I literally spent a full weekend installing the program and learning how to use it so that I could match the requirement of my client. And as a result of that, we got achieved $100,000 in sales. Sales that would not have been achieved if I sat here and said, no, I want to use Zoom, I only use Zoom. That's not flexible, that's not agile. And I've also uh, made some recordings of some pre-study content, which is now a passive income. So I put the work in, I put the recording, it's up online, and then that is now creating a passive income. All of this would not have happened if I was not a flexible or agile enough to adapt my business model. So I wanna hear from you guys though. Tell me guys, what, yeah, agree with me on Teams, yes. And, oh, Pakistan. Yeah, we, we had some coaching clients from Pakistan as well. <laughs> oh, very good, Jason. I didn't wait for advice or permission to start a Facebook group. Just, just get it done. What do they say? Sometimes it's better to ask for forgiveness than ask for permission. <laughs> yeah. But I, I like your thinking, Jason. This is kind of, this is the mindset. This, this is what it means to be courageous, right? To, to, to take an action, to do something different if we're looking to do and achieve different results. Working online and use team meeting more, developing emotional intelligence, yep, become a certified coach and mentoring from an ICF virtual learning and using Microsoft Teams. Yep, yep, remote work first experience had the best way to work smoothly with my team. That's right, guys, guess what? It's, it's up here, it's having the possibility, right? That we, we can work as virtual leaders and coach. When we tell ourselves, I'm not technically smart, I can't do it, I'm too old, then that's exactly the kind of result that you're going to achieve. 
right? To manage my expectations. Beautiful, 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 beautiful. Awesome, guys. So thank you for sharing yours as well. Um, what I have observed with both my clients and people that I know is this moment in time being a virtual leader actually gives most people greater flexibility whether it's to homeschool the kids or now that the schools are open to drop the kids off and then get back and do the work uh you know do a couple of hours work on a saturday morning that's what i do sometimes simply to get it out of my head so then it's done so that i can enjoy the rest of the weekend that results in less stress and then work from home for most people is more freedom. Awesome. So possibility guys, the possibility, you know, the possibility starts right here, plus having a solution focus, right? It's so easy to focus on the problem. People are really good at focusing on the problem and people love to talk about the problem, but talking about the problem doesn't solve the problem. So when you have a mindset, of possibility and a mindset to focus on the solution right get clear on the problem yes it's when, when it's this is not all you know positive thinking and, and 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 rainbows and unicorns it's not about denying the truth when we identify a problem we get clear on the problem we we drill down we get to the root cause of the problem but then as quickly as possible we know that we need to focus our energies on the solution. And as we do that as a leader, we then encourage the same in our teams as well. Now, obviously agility is all built into here as well, being flexibility. When you have that possibility, that flexibility, the agility and the solution focus, that's going to give you your result. But that is a mindset and that starts with you. If you're struggling in your team or your team or your department and your business is somehow struggling, chances are there's a very narrow uh, focus. There's a very narrow way of thinking. And Henry Ford says it the best, guys. Whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're absolutely right. So when you say, oh, I can't operate Microsoft Teams or I can't operate the Zoom or um, oh, it's going to be so difficult to manage my teams virtually, guess what? Whatever you tell yourself repeatedly will become true for you. That is the reality that you're going to create. It becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. So it's super, super important that you get really, really positive in the way that you structure your thoughts and by having that possibility mindset and that solution focus you'll be surprised at the solutions that you can come up with All right so it's kind of like this in between your ears is what is known what is familiar and what you are aware of right what you are consciously aware of that's inside here uh, other people might call that your comfort zone. This is all the actions and behaviors that you've already done. It's, it's already known to you. It's already familiar to you. And you have a certain level of conscious awareness about this. But here's the thing. If this is your level of understanding, you, you can also call this your level of consciousness, if you like. If this is your level of consciousness right here, and you, you're looking to solve a problem, you're looking to achieve a goal, you're looking to get to that next level of success, whatever that might be for you. Because guess what? That goal that you want to achieve, that problem that you want to find the solution for, that new and improved version of yourself, it's not at this level of thinking. This level of thinking is that comfort zone right here, right there. So that next level of you is outside of what you know. So therefore, it's unknown, right? Because if you knew, you'd already have achieved it. If you knew, you would have already taken those actions and those behaviors to go out there and get it. So therefore, there is an element of something that you don't know that you don't know in order to get to that next level or unknown. It's also unfamiliar, right? You, you're simply, it's not, maybe you've tried it once or twice like 10 years ago, but you kind of forgot it right? A certain strategy or something that you did, a tool or a technique or whatever. So it's now unfamiliar. You are, or it is unaware. 
So all of that is that new level of thinking. All of that exists outside of your comfort zone. And your solution to that problem, whatever that problem is you're looking to solve, whether it's achieving that goal, fixing that problem, or starting your own business, or expanding your business, whatever it is, your solution to that problem, it exists in the unknown, in the unfamiliar, and in the unaware. In other words, you're not yet aware or conscious of it. But the good news is, guys, it exists. It is out there. But it's up to you to continually grow and evolve yourself so that you can become aware of these tools and techniques that can help take you to that next level. Einstein says it very, very well. Insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. Guess what? That's happening in the known and the familiar and the aware. That's doing the same thing over and over. Therefore, doing things unknown, unfamiliar, or that you're not aware of yet, that is doing something different, which is going to take you to that next level of success. So adjusting to the client's needs. Now we're starting to implement everything we've kind of discovered so far about being uh, agile, about being uh, open-minded and curious, being a little bit courageous, being flexible, right? Uh, focusing on the solution and the possibility. This is gonna help you now adjust to your client's needs. Now your client could be your client client, someone who's buying your products and services. But guess what? Anyone you have a relationship with is kind of like a client. Your subordinates, in a way, are your clients. They have an expectation of you, you have an expectation of them, right? Normally, with a normal client, there's an expectation that I will pay this money, I will receive this service, right? Well, guess what? It's the same if you're the leader and there's a subordinate you have an expectation that because they get paid a salary, that they will deliver these deliverables, these outcomes. So just know that what we're about to cover here, your clients are those people who you're working with on a regular basis. Your, your client clients, your bosses, the stakeholders on the project or your teams. So first thing we need to do is listen. Listen, listen, listen. However good you think you are at listening, double your efforts because, and I can't remember who said this, when we speak, we're only sharing information that we already know, which is, guess what? That's in that little comfort zone of what you know, what you're familiar and what you are aware. When we listen, we have the opportunity to learn something new. So as we're born with two ears and one mouth, we should listen twice as much as we talk. And when we talk about coaching principles, you know, if, you, if you're looking to uh, bring in some coaching principles into your leadership journey, then coaching rule 101 is we never, ever, ever, never, ever, ever, never, ever tell our clients what to do. We listen. And well, what if you practice that with your clients, with your subordinates, with your paying clients? What if you really listen to them and instead don't try to force your solution, your idea? Don't do that. If you're, if you're leading that, then you're not going to learn anything new. And they're going to feel that. They won't feel that you respect them. And you, what you're really doing is you're closing off to possibilities because you're only sharing from your, your way of thinking, your level of consciousness. Guess what? When we open up to listen to more information and data around us, well, that becomes more data for us to make a more informed decision. So you want to listen. What is it that they want and need? Don't assume, don't mind read. Simply ask and then listen carefully. Next is patience, right? Which is almost contradictory to agility. Yet I have found in working with my clients at the moment, especially my corporate clients, I've needed to be very, very patient. Because why? Everyone is dealing with a higher level of uncertainty. For example, I was recently engaged with a very large telecommunication uh, organization in Malaysia. 
I was talking to them before lockdown, for about six months before lockdown to go down there and deliver a training in Malaysia. Then lockdown. And so we basically converted the whole program to be an online series of uh, leadership and virtual coaching webinar series, five series delivered over a couple of weeks. And I had to be very, very patient through that whole process. Why? Because there's so much uncertainty going on. And this is a really big organization. I couldn't push them. I'm I sorry. couldn't force them. What I did do, though, very, very well, was as soon as I got any information from them, in other words, whenever they gave me some kind of update on, on the project status, how quickly do you think I responded to them? Super, super quick. And after every single webinar that we did, within two minutes of me finishing talking, I would blah, 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 bye everyone, and I would log off. I would then send the project lead at this company a WhatsApp and I said, please tell me, how was the session? Any suggestions for improvement? So even though it was grinding a little bit slow on this project from my point of view, because I was patient to work at the pace that they wanted to work, yet at the same time was able to give them information and adjust any feedback they give me, I incorporated it immediately. You know, I remember at one of the last sessions, their L&D director, he said to the whole group, if you guys want to know about Agile, you can model Mr. Luke's responses, right? I'm not saying that to brag. I'm saying that because it worked. It, it got the result with this client. And I want you to be able to apply these same principles with your client. So be patient. Then when you have that information, be agile and then be patient and then be agile, right? It's a dance, right? Which is what do we mean by being flexible. Remember the law of requisite variety. The person with the most flexibility will control the situation, will control the system, right? So we did the first batch of this five webinar series with this client. We made the adjustments. I tweaked as we went. We were very, very agile. They were so pleased that we just rolled out the second batch as well, right? So because we were flexible, because I was dancing with the client, even though it might've been frustrating at times, it's okay. Why? Because I was listening, I had the patience and I had the flexibility. So I invite you to do the same if you're really serious about creating a win-win with your clients. Remember, clients could be the paying client or your boss or your subordinates or the other stakeholders. Make sense, guys? So wrapping up, gosh, oh no, I've still got 11 minutes. That's plenty of time. Um, right, emotions and results. So, so this brings us to the final little point about today. Uh, again, we, we've kind of wrapped it all up and brought it together here. The thoughts that you have moment to moment, and we've already talked about your thoughts are going to be positive and flexible and agile and solution focused, together with the way that you use your body, right, your physiology. There's a synergy between your thoughts and the way that you use your body. The synergy of the way that you think and the way that you use your body creates your emotion, right, your emotional state in this moment in time. Now, this is important because the way that you feel moment to moment determines your behavior and your behavior is simply your actions or what you do. And of course, your actions and what you do, that's going to create the results in your life and business. So why is this important? Well, it's important to be able to manage your emotion, especially as a leader, especially as a virtual leader and or coach. So in other words, if we look at emotion here, right? If you have a low emotional state, you're angry, tired, frustrated, fed up, overwhelmed or whatever, you have a low emotional state. That low emotional state will create lower actions, behaviors and things that you do, which are in turn going to create less than good results. Now, the opposite is also true. If you're able to elevate your emotional state, if you're able to get into those states of passion and, and, and being energized, 
Well, that higher emotion will result in better actions, more creativity, more flexibility, better things to do, which of course is going to produce better results. Is that important as a leader? Uh-huh. Is that important as a business owner or a coach? Uh-huh. You bet it is. So what we're talking about here, guys, is influence. In other words, your influence is linked to how you feel in this moment in time. And if you're a leader or you're a coach, the in, your ability to influence is one of your strongest skills that you need to have. So the definition is the capacity to have an effect on the character, <clears throat> pardon me, have an effect on the character development or behavior of someone, right? So this is what we mean by influence. So who can tell me actually, guys, before I, before I share this, who can tell me what other emotional state that you want to be able to feel to influence people more quickly? What emotional state? So remember, low emotion is low influence, low results. High emotion is high influence, high results. Let's take a look if you can um, give me some here. While we're looking at that, guys, I'm going to look at some of your questions a moment ago. Uh, agility requires positive emotion. Very, very nice. Thank you. Uh, with junior staff, don't we need to give the solution sometimes? Yes, Elizabeth, the answer is yes. You can't coach all of the people all of the time. Uh, so sometimes we do need to tell them, sometimes we need to train them, sometimes we need to uh, mentor them. So awesome. So I like your answers here, guys. Empathy, friendly behavior, understanding, trust. Awesome, very good, very good. So one thing is for sure, if you want to influence at a higher level, and remember this is talking about influencing your clients, which could be your paying clients or your subordinates or anyone. You want enthusiasm, right? Think enthusiasm, think passion. You want to be able to be able to, you want to be able to turn that on like a switch. You definitely want passion, right? So that enthusiasm to, you know, think of enthusiasm like, like that positive mindset, like that solution focus, like there is a possibility. I won't give up. I'm, I'm enthusiastic that we can do this together, team, that I will find a solution for you, client. And then you want to be able to turn your passion on like a switch. And then finally, presence right? Presence is being right here, right now, together with your client, whoever that might be. This is what's going to help you influence at a higher level. This is what is going to help you to overcome those problems. This is going to support you to create solutions together with your teams or your clients. Make sense, guys? So virtual presentation and best practices. If you guys have any other tips, please share them with me. Uh, again, I am not pretending to be uh, a guru in this area. I know there's virtual backdrops and all these other fancy things, but please tell me uh, based on some webinars that either you have been a part of or meetings that you've been a part of, please share with the group some of your virtual presentation best practices, which could be a webinar or simply a meeting or a conversation or whatever. Please share them into the chat box now. Uh, make sure you've got good Wi-Fi, uh, pretty obvious, and a backup. So I've got my Wi-Fi here in the condo and then I've got my hotspot here ready to go in the event of a blackout or something like that. Request videos turned on, not so important for webinars like this, but definitely for uh, corporate, for meetings and things like that. It's, it's, it's just, I think, a little bit rude sometimes when people have their cameras off. When you're having a constructive meeting with someone, you can pick up so much more uh, when you can see people's faces. Uh, breakout rooms and group discussions. I found these to be very, very effective in the corporate workshops that I've facilitated. The more time you can give them together to kind of brainstorm and discuss, the happier they seem to be. Obviously remove distractions. What else guys, please tell me. What other tips or suggestions do you have please? Show confidence in the subject, more engagement with the participants, have good lighting too. Yeah, I've got one of those ring lights here, which I, I did not have before. Uh, drive the subject forward. Use a variety of tools, virtual whiteboard. Yeah, I've even seen like an actual whiteboard. Someone will pull in a whiteboard behind them. 
Um, being real, I, I like that, Elizabeth. Being authentic and just being real because guess what? Sometimes we have technical glitches. So this isn't about being perfect. It's just being being able to do the best that you can. So awesome, guys. I, I remember to record the session. I love it, Alison. Oh, I've been, uh, I've been bit on that once or twice. <laughs> so in addition to those great tips, more engagement is always better, right? We're a little bit limited here. We only have one hour. I do the best that I can to uh, with the engagement. That's why we use the chat box. If we, have a, uh, if we have an auditory chat, it slows things down a little bit. So that's why I love the chat box. Add value to your audience, right? Whoever your audience is, if you can add value, they will appreciate that. Booklets and learning materials. So with some of these other more recent webinars uh, that I've been doing with corporates, um, where you know they've got 40 participants from eight different countries, I will prepare the booklets in advance. So as I'm sharing my screen, they can go through the booklets as well. Super, super convenient for them. And ask for feedback. If you wanna improve your virtual presentations, be brave, right? And simply ask for feedback. And finally, guys, the last little tip I wanna leave you with today is, again, and this is all part of your mindset, is a, a, a little model that I borrowed from Tony Robbins, uh, what he calls, can I? Constant and never ending improvement. In other words, there are, there's always, always, always room to improve. And that, that's why Christy and I attend at least three or four different trainings uh, around the world uh, whenever we can. We were lucky this year. We actually got two trainings in uh, this year before lockdown. We did a session in Dubai as, as a student for seven days. And then we went to, uh, to the USA uh, for a training over there for five days. So uh, I've got about one or two more trainings to attend before the end of the year. So I invite you to wherever you are on your leadership journey, wherever you are on your coaching journey, have that mindset. Be curious like a kid because everything you want to achieve is existing outside of your comfort zone. In other words, it's either unfamiliar, unknown or unaware. So... With that, I, I would like to uh, invite you to our ICF Leadership Coaching Certification. Uh, we just finished one in July, where we had, uh, we had about 12 students join us here in Bangkok, and we had 14 students join us from around the world from like eight different countries. This session on 26 and 27 of September, it's fully virtual online program. Uh, there is some pre-study. There's about 15 hours of pre-study learning that you'll do via, uh, you'll watch some videos and complete a little bit of tasking. We'll have two days virtual workshop where we use Zoom. I have a Zoom assistant who helps me with the breakout room. So there's plenty of practice. And this is your first step to become a fully certified ICF coach. Or if you want to apply coaching principles in your leadership role, then I recommend you join us for this. We do have an early bird on this one. I will email the details to you a little bit later. Very, very affordable with payment plans as well. So thank you all very, very much, guys. Let me quickly stop the share here. If you'd be so kind, just turn your cameras on quickly and let me unmute you all. Make a little bit of noise uh, so we can hear you guys. Um, no, I don't want to mute you all. How do we unmute? Uh, unmute. Awesome, guys. Thank you all very, very much. I hope you enjoyed today. Thank you. Uh, it's so nice to see those familiar faces. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Thanks right. for joining Thank us. Thank you very much. Hope to see you again next time. Thank and, you very uh, much. Take care. Stay safe. You. Stay Bye. awesome. Thank and you see you guys much. next Thank time. You. Bye Wonderful for now. Session. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Thank you.